So how's everyone feeling this morning? So it's a pretty big room and we're not filling every seat, so is it possible to uh, <coughs> ask folks to move up a few rooms? <coughs> that way we can interact a bit more. That's the end. That'll make no passing easier. <laughs> so this is kind of a weird setup. I'm usually used to doing more circle sort of things, but was everyone at the panel last night? As Steve said, uh, Organizing has become much more like sleepovers with drones. So I guess we can break away from circles and do a more formal presentation. So energetic, I like Yeah, I've known Steve for a while. He only gets better with time. Uh, so we want to do a quick introduction and make sure everyone has a chance to hear each other's names, hear where you're coming from. So what we're going to do is our name, our campus, and one thing you want to do this semester for fun that's not related to organizing. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to think, and I'm also going to give the first example. So my name is Chris X. I'm not a student. I'm a national youth organizer with Student Labor Action Project. Uh, I went to Wichita State University and was at YDS back then. So now I travel the country working with SLAP students and still try and engage YDS where and when I can. And one thing I want to do after the school semester or doing it for fun, I really want to go camping in Big Sur in California by Santa Cruz. Uh, just because it's a mountain on a beach with like a river to go kayaking. It's everything in one place. So that's something I want to do. And we'll start there. I'm Steve. Um, I'm from the suburbs outside Philadelphia. I'm not in college yet, but I'm um, going next year. And uh, something I want to do for the fun soon is just go to a bunch of concerts, <coughs> basically. Um, I'm David, I'm a student at Clinton High School. I'm from upstate New York, and one thing I want to do for fun is uh, play a lot of video games. Good man. Um, uh, my name is Josh Lizer, uh, I'm from Temple. Uh, thing I want to do for fun um, is, is play more guitar. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deanna, I'm from Temple High School. Major. Um, I think I want to go to Canada and spend time. And we'll jump over there. My name is Nick Robinson. I'm from Temple, and I went to Atlantic City over the uh, winter break. So I'd, I'd like to go back before the semester's over. <coughs> My name's Ryan. I'm from uh, the University of Rochester. I'm involved with SDS there. Um, and uh, study history, and I suppose I want to travel a little bit more in the United States. Hopefully, do uh, the Midwest and the so. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Lucia. I'm from Argentina, and I go to Georgetown. And in the summer, I want to travel from Asia. Are you active with Georgetown Solidarity Committee? Um, no, like I'm actually with Jersey on Dubai, but we call that work sometimes. So nobody wants to go. <laughs> I'm Robert, I'm from Vassar. Uh, this summer I'd like to go to the beach. <laughs> I'm Spencer, I'm from Vassar as well. Uh, in, in a couple weeks I'm going down for my first southern road trip, so that should be fun. I'm Dad, I'm from Ohio, I'm from Boston. And I'm Dan Hansen from the College of Worcester, and what I want to do this semester is to finally finish my senior thesis, it's also about unions, so I can finally get really drunk again. And uh, barring any other parts of the introduction, um, I will be starting off with American labor history. Yeah, I just want to do a quick wrap and say, as organizers and activists, it's easy to get caught in a rut where we don't think about what we want to do for fun, which is why I like to do that introductory question where we have to have lives outside of organizing, <coughs> otherwise we burn out, and that doesn't help everything we're about to hear about. So no life outside of organizing. Okay, um, like I said, I'm Dan Hansen from College of Worcester, and the segment of this presentation that I'm going to be discussing is sort of the broader narrative 
of 20th century American labor movement. 20th century I use as a much more broader term than, of course, just 1900 to 2000. Um, since the era that, you know, kind of the American labor movement, I think, really starts off with in earnest from a historical perspective is around the um, 1869, uh, 1870, um, this era, around 1873, there was large economic turndown, which marked one of the first times in American history that um, an economic recession had affected kind of the working people and the masses vastly more than it affected um, like the kind of the, the wealthy ruling class. And this is, of course, what we know now as the Gilded Age. And, you know, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, this was very much the era of, like, railroad trusts and media conglomeration and things like that. And it's sort of the first era in U.S. history that we really see um, uh, kind of corporatization of capital in a much more profound way that really invoked a more militant response from organized labor. <laughs> And um, in this militant response, I call this era about 1869 to 1835, get to what those dates mean in a minute, the era of militant labor, by which I mean this is the era in which unions formed and their main force of power was militant, often violent strikes, with, um, which happened um, outside of the bounds of kind of politically recognized legitimate authority. Uh, I use 1869 as the first bookend because that is the year that the Knights of Labor formed. Um, has anyone heard of the Knights of Labor? Okay, good. Um, that was basically, the, this was sort of the first major craft trade union confederation in the United States. Um, it kind of began as like a professional organization or brotherhood of professionals from different industries, then kind of grew uh, much more well, not necessarily more radical, but much more um, militant over the next several decades. Um, so it was founded 1869, and after this it grew very rapidly. Um, by 1885 it represented 110,000 workers across the United States. So like I said, this is the first kind of trade union that became a very major uh, figure in the American labor movement. or really started the American labor movement as we know it. And um, this was under the leadership of Terence Powderly, who became one of the major um, kind of organizers of the Confederation. And in 1886, we have <coughs> the Haymarket Affair. Um, once again, show of hands, who has the term Haymarket with any kind of specific significance. Okay, that's good. This was basically um, a Chicago, this was a uh, strike by industrial workers in Chicago uh, from several different industries, um, like striking in anticipation of an eight hour work day. And the eight hour work day was one of the biggest demands of this era. Like by one estimate between um, 1881 and 1897, there were 18,000 strikes across the country with eight hour workday, higher wages among the largest of the demands. But um, 1886, you have basically the Haymarket strike led largely by the Knights of Labor in Haymarket Square in Chicago. And basically, as per the era of militant labor, this instantly conflagrated into like an extremely violent affair, which was kind of hijacked by a large anarchist element, and who, um, which ultimately resulted in the deaths of several police officers. And so this became seen as like, you know, kind of the major defining moment in very early, very early militant um, industrial unionism. And also, as will be a long recurring theme in the history of American unions, um, this event was actually much more uh, a depression or, um, or much more of a letdown for the organization that organized it because by 18 or by like the year after Haymarket the Knights of Labor as we know it had all but dissolved and this shows how um, kind of this uh, this strike and this like massive massive affair instead of the union being able to take all this publicity and turn it into power uh, basically what happened is there became a massive internal debate between the ideologies of craft unionism and industrial unionism, which we'll get to 
a little bit in the coming decades. Um, basically, the ideology behind craft unionism is the ruling form of unionism which we have today, in which orker, workers are generally organized along like along their specific positions of employment. Whereas within industrial unionism, you have a union that represents everyone within a particular industry. So the latter becomes a much more radical, um, much more radical alternative to kind of the skilled trade unionism that people become very familiar with. And other major events in this era it, that kind of exemplify the militant unionism I'm talking about is um, the 1894 Pullman strike. Show of hands if that's familiar. Oh, nice. Um, that was led, of course, by the late and wonderful Eugene Debs of, of, of um, uh, the Union of Railroad Workers. And this led, this was a strike of railroad workers that was ultimately ended by a federal injunction um, when the workers began using sabotage against the uh, railroad corporation itself. Um, another example is the Ludlow strike in 1913. You have Mother Mary Jones, better known as Mother Jones, who led a major strike of the United Mine Workers in Colorado, which, as with many things of this era, ended with a state militia being um, yeah, being brought in, several people being killed. You know, it's wonderful, <coughs> cheerful stuff when we talk about the history of the labor movement. And then 1905, we have um, uh, Mer Mother Jones, Eugene Debs, Big Bill Haywood and a few other people uh, met in Chicago to form the union that would be known as the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, like I said, the distinction between industrial and craft unionism is a very important development because the IWW or the Wobblies, as everyone calls them, and although literally no one knows why they're called the Wobblies, which I think is really interesting, uh, the Wobblies was definitely the most important exponent of really militant industrial unionism that we think of. They were um, probably one of the first major unions that you could definitely identify as a radical political ideology. They advocated the overthrow of the wage system, and they were really just very interesting people in general. Um, and of course, going into the next era, we have the era of labor recognition. And this is when the more radical elements of the American labor movement, the, um, such as industrial unionism, such as these really militant wildcat strikes. Uh, another vocab thing, who knows what a wildcat strike is? Well, a wildcat strike is basically the idea that, you know, instead of a strike being authorized by, by a union as a national organization, a strike is... Um, a spontaneous revolt of workers at the ground level, and that is a lot. That is like closely associated with all of the violence and uh, et cetera of the era of militant labor. Um, I begin in 1935 because that is when the Wagner Act was passed under the New Deal, and the Wagner Act, of course, set up the National Labor Relations Board, which. Um, uh, you know, on the whole, it's very easy to see as a victory for the labor movement. Um, another thing, well, the National Labor Relations Board, of course, being the federal uh, body to recognize unions and legitimate them, uh, could easily be seen as a victory for the labor movement. Um, of course, from some of the more radical elements, such as the IWW, they did not necessarily agree with this because it is seen as taking away some of the democratic essence from kind of militant unionism. And um, that's that, like the decline of militant unionism is definitely kind of the hallmark of this era. Um, like going back to the split between industrial and craft unionism, we have the split of the Congress of Industrial Organizations from the American Federation of Labor. Uh, the AFL had become kind of the predominant uh, craft union federation right in the wake of Haymarket and the demise of the Knights of Labor. Uh, the CIO was committed, once again, to a more um, solidarity-based, more industrial, more radical uh, organizing philosophy, whereas the AFL, which ultimately won, won over it, of course, was devoted to a more traditional, more professional uh, craft unionism. And so you have that split, and, and then in 1947, uh, during the height of the Red Scare, which was a massive, like, detriment to the labor movement. 
you have the Taft-Hartley Act passed. And basically the main thing that Taft-Hartley does is it's seen, it's combating unions as, um, to the degree that they're seen as a communistic threat. Like all recognized unions must like take an oath that they do not harbor communists, stuff like that. And it also outlaws these wildcat strikes that have become so militant in the years before that. And this had a lot of wide reaching effects on the labor movement. Like you look at Operation Dixie, 1948, which was a major AFL and CIO um, organizing drive in the South. Um, a lot of these efforts, um, like for example, a lot of them tried to set up unions in you know, North, South Carolina, etc. But then their efforts to dispel communists and radicals from the unions was so intense that they actually alienated a lot of people, for example. Um, another thing that rose up during this era is the inc uh, increasing influence of like Hispanic and other immigrants into the United States workforce. And um, like when we, a lot of the times we think of this era, we think of United Farm Workers and Farm Labor Organizing Committee and like other Hispanic-led or um, unions like that. <coughs> what was very interesting is all of these like Hispanic-led unions actively opposed illegal immigration because this is the era in which you know American labor becomes the main thing and unions are seen as protecting American jobs primarily. Um, so also during this era we slowly see the broad decline of the labor movement. You know the CIO becomes reabsorbed by the AFL in I think 1955 and like these general ideologies of like militant unionism are generally beginning to um, be swept under the rug. And so then I go to this final era of labor movement, which I call labor pacification and renewal. I uh, started in eight, 1981. Any ideas on why 1981? Yeah. Uh, um, isn't that the thing where, where a while where they fought out of out of control, so it was all sack? Yeah, that's exactly it. That was um when the Union of Air Traffic Controllers, uh, PATCO, don't remember what that stands for, uh, basically went on a walkout strike and then uh, Ronald Reagan, our good old friend, used the executive order to basically say, all of you go back to work or you're fired, which was sort of a major precedent in you know, executive order of decertifying a union for what was considered the uh, public good. And of course, that is one of the main uh, main milestones, the beginning of the wonderful, um, wonderful process we know as neoliberalism, which has also resulted in a very uh, steady decline in both wages and union density since this era. So, I mean, today we definitely have the lowest union density that we have had since the mid to late 20th century, I believe, reflecting this decline. However, there are also, as Chris will get to, other reasons that the labor movement is starting to try and renew itself and responding to kind of a workforce that is not based in the same industrial economy of the early 20th century, but more like service, uh, service industry center, things like that. Uh, but like the change to win coalition, the CTW, is a major aspect in this kind of um, self-healing process of the labor movement. This is like SCIU, Unite Here, several other unions that are basically dropped out of the AFL-CIO because of their concern over the, um, basically the inherent democratic nature of unions. And a lot of these represent, you know, lots of immigrants in the workforce, lots of like service sector people and stuff. And this responds to like the general argument that over the 20th century, uh, the history of unions is the history of unions becoming more undemocratic, more kind of conglomerated, stuff like that. And of course, as we're seeing with this changing workforce, we are seeing a change in the kind of people, as I said, who are being unionized, which, as you know, Chris will, uh, is about to get to, will um, include a lot of new people like students, TAs, etc. And I'm sure that's something you can talk a lot more about right now. So just. I think PAC, uh, PACO stands for Professional Air Traffic Controller Organization. They're now known as NATCO, uh, National Air Traffic Controller Association. So after they were decertified, they became an association. And I only know that because I work out of the NATCO building. 
I'm on the second floor. So, uh, I think the change to win is a good place to leave off. So SEIU in 2006 leads the split from the Federation, the AFL-CIO. And the Teamsters leave, Unite Here leaves, a lot of major unions actually left in that split and created a change to win. A few years before that, SEIU had sent a group of union leaders to South Africa to meet with union leaders there to talk about organizing grocery workers. So the baggers, the cashiers, all those people. And there was a really interesting conversation I had that Bill Fletcher writes about in Solidarity Divide. And it was around the question, what is the role of unions? So before I tell you the quote, I'm just curious, what do people who don't think the role of unions is? What do you think is the union's job? To kind of um, like to kind of check the power of the employer, just to make sure you can't take advantage of the workers. So contract negotiation. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? David, Josh. Uh, I mean, I don't. Uh, this isn't what you mean. Sh should be in my opinion, but it seems that uh, oftentimes uh, right now they have a very like a, a service model um, of like you pay dues and this is like buying like buying services rather than like an actual form of you know solidarity. Anyone else? Defend workers on the job. Could we be specific about which workers? Is it all workers or is it union workers? Well, it should be. All the workers on the job. Should be. Is it? <laughs> a lot of, well, it depends. A lot of places have multiple unions, but. It's very true. More and more attempts and stuff. Yeah, I mean, in the top should we be X way or draw close to come back to me, get a boss in the way they walk is operating. So having a voice in rules and regulations? So I think this is all really good. So the conversation that happened, is what's the role of unions? And SDIU leaders from the US said, to protect our workers, to protect our members, specifically our people. And the leaders from South Africa said, the role of unions is to protect the working class, which is a completely different orientation. Like that slight shift of union members versus working class. If you think about the Keystone Pipeline stuff, there, does everyone know what that was? Could someone briefly explain it? <coughs> Isn't that essentially um, they wanted to build a giant pipeline from Canada down through America to import oil, was it? And it was going to be like very non-environmentally friendly. Yeah. And there was a lot of opposition. Essentially, it would have propelled global warming at an even faster rate and destroyed the planet in probably the next 50 years. Like, it's not scientific, but that's what everyone was saying. Like, that's how I generalize it. So unions came out in favor, not all of them, but some of them, because it was going to create jobs. It was going to protect their members. It was terrible for the economy. It was terrible for us. But they took that stance because they knew their membership. So I'm curious, what do people think of when you think of the working class? Like, what does the working class look like now? And describe jobs. Who's in the working class? Just say. Uh, Walmart workers, service sector. Yeah. Who else? I abbreviate Walmart WMT. Just so everyone knows. Blue collar laborers. <coughs> what does that look like? Oh, um, factory workers. Did I hear mothers? Oh. Plumbers. Plumbers, yeah. No. School laborers. If I spelled plumbers wrong, we're just moving on and no one's going to point it out. I think that's right. I think it's right? I'm not sure. <laughs> Who else? Yeah. Who else? Teachers? Teachers? Who else? Cops. 
also, yeah, I was going to say, just say public sector. I'm sorry, what? Public sector. Yeah. Poor public sector. Tough times. So that's singular. So we're seeing what happens in this era is very different from what's happening in this era. Lots of factories, lots of skilled labor. That's the face of the working class. Like if you look at a poster of working class in 1930, it's the face of like someone in a meat packing factory. If you look at it today, it's growingly this Walmart worker in overall service. Like does everyone know the store at H&M? They sell really cool clothes at really high prices that are made with a lot of exploited labor that fall apart pretty quickly. I've shopped there before, I'm sad to say. But in New York City, they've got seven stores, all seven of them. And the average age of the worker there is 18 to 23. All seven just voted to unionize. So it's this new industry. Like, no one's ever gone to an H&M worker and said, do you like your job? Would you want to unionize it? Like, this is new. Uh, it's growingly, actually, care providers. Does anyone know what that is? Well, not just the elderly. Who else needs care? Children, I think they kill a black black people who like single moms don't have long time to like what won't be so you have to take care of sick. Yeah, so you're talking about child care, you're talking about those suffering from disabilities, you're talking about the elderly, and what's happening in our economy right now? Like <coughs> think about the population, what's happening? <coughs> I'll give you a hint. What's happening? The baby boomers aren't just getting old. Every eight seconds, another baby boomer retires. So it's something like right now there are three million care jobs where it's, some of these are public sector jobs. If you look at Ohio, there are 27,000 care worker providers for the state that are not allowed to unionize even though they're public sector and they're trying to cut those jobs. But we're at the same time seeing this elderly population start to retire and need more care than ever because people can't afford to go to retirement homes anymore because they've had their pensions cut, social security is getting cut, like they've got less access. So they need more help as these jobs are eliminated. So what we're seeing is these workers are being exploited even more. These workers are being exploited even more because they have to take on more cases, they have to go to more houses, and it's just becoming unstable. And they were excluded in the NLRA, the act that allowed workers to unionize. Did I say that right? The Taft, the Wagner Act, where they were allowed. So these workers get excluded. So all those workers in Ohio are just screwed. So what we're seeing is a new face to the American working class. So we've had to create new structures in which to go in and talk to these care providers, Walmart associates. Speaking of Walmart associates, so does anyone heard of our Walmart? Could you explain it? Um, I, I mean, I, I heard of it, but I don't like the yellow black box of the house, I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. So our Walmart stands for Organization United for Respect. It's Walmart associates that have come together. They pay $5 a month to UFCW, United Food and Commercial Workers, and they're taking the first steps towards Union Station of Walmart. And this has involved them going to Bentonville and protesting at the national headquarters and all these different things. And the reason why these new sectors are unionizing it and organizing at such a high rate is because they've been excluded from a lot of what Dan talked about. And that's because the labor movement was built incorrectly in the US. It just evolved over time. You've got AFL-CIO protecting union contracts and trying to do new worker organizing at the same time, and it's impossible. And that's something that we've come to a realization of. The reason why union density is continuously getting smaller is if I'm having to go to Ohio to fight SB5, if I'm having to go to Wisconsin to fight Governor Walker and everything, I'm biting to hold the line. I'm not pushing forward. So. We've learned it's unstable to have unions do all the new worker organizing and also defend all the contracts and also play the electoral role that they do, which we know is huge. 
And it's also why Republicans are going after them and trying to get paycheck deception passed, which effectively means union dues can't be spent on political purposes. And they've proposed that in 17 states. It's going to, if Democrats start losing in record numbers in Florida, it's going to be due to paycheck deception. So we're seeing these workers be organized by national domestic workers alliance. So it's not a union. It's actually an alliance. You're seeing Walmart Associates being organized by our Walmart with support from UFCW, but associates are going to associates. So we're seeing a new form of worker organizing. That's kind of what was going on with the Wobblies and everything before the Wagner Act. Workers were organically organizing, and we're in a time period where that's happening. And I want to, I know we've only got five minutes. We have a five minute warning five minutes early. Uh, I want to talk about our campuses. So when you think about workers on your campus, who do you think is unionized? Or who do you think can unionize? <coughs> TAs? Food providers? Security fits? Could you be more specific? So I heard grads. Yeah, and or and or undergrad. All students. Well, which undergrad workers can unionize? Well, they have to have a job. Like, can the librarians unionize? Can well, I was just saying, in addition to the job, the students. So, does anyone pay student fees to go to school? Or some form of like student activities outside of tuition? Like show of hands? <coughs> so where does who controls the student fees? Where does that money go? Campus council controls the school. Victor, where does that money go? Like student fee money? Yeah. Uh, it depends on what it's allocated for. I mean, if, if the university system is charging you a fee to keep up your labs or your libraries, that money is going to the university institution where students are running self taxing referendums, and that money goes back to the students. So, students via student governments, student unions actually are unionized in a sense. This is the same structure. I pay money to go to the school that goes to the student government that they can use for organizing. How many people in this room have a student government that runs voter registration drives? How many people have a student government that gets buses to bus students for lobby days? So that's something we should be thinking about. There weren't a whole lot of hands. Right now, students actually have the same structure as unions, and we need to be organizing that money to be building our campaigns, because they can buy bags, they can print materials, they can send people to lobby and advocate for students. It could be done on the state level, the city level, the federal level. We need to be organizing those resources that we already control. But to go back to this, so can TAs unionize? Like, is there a history of it? So right now there's some problems. You should go talk to some NYU students. But yes, uh, also research assistants. Dining hall workers. Do people know if dining hall workers in your campus are unionized? Who are they unionized with? SEIU. SEIU. Unite Here does it a lot too. What about security guards? You're from Temple. Uh, I'm not sure if they're unionized or not. No, we have Allied Party, but they're not unionized. So they used to be. Yeah. Before, I think two years ago is when the contract got broken. But these are folks we can be unionizing. Does anyone know if janitors or custodial workers are? Yeah. Uh, groundskeepers? Historically, uh, AFSCME, American Federation of State, County, <coughs> Municipality, Employees. Yeah. Adjuncts, people know if they are? Sometimes. Sometimes. Kind of going back to the NYU thing. Something that no one said, what about 
RAs in the dorms. Has anyone ever asked an RA if they have to take on too much work or if they feel like they don't get enough support from the university? So RAs at UMass Amherst, which is about three hours away from here, are unionized. They actively bargain collectively with the university. They have a contract that gives them health care. They get training on working with students dealing with depression, with alcoholism, with all sorts of things. And that gives them a lot of power in their university. They actually have a very large say in the policies and regulations that go on in the dorms. When it's time to do voter registration, because they're union members, they open up the doors and say, go register everyone. If you have a petition that's going to help campus workers, they open up the doors and say, go talk to everyone. So can anyone think of another position on campus that you think could be unionized that isn't on this list? Uh, by and large, professors are with AOT. Depends on what state. Who else? American Federation of Teachers. What about the student newspaper? Has anyone ever asked their student newspaper if they're unionized? Do you mean the people who work in the student newspaper? Mm -hmm. And that would be with CWA, Communication Workers of America. They're pretty awesome. I'll say that and then I'll do this. I'm a CWA member. Who else? So I want to do this because when we think about our universities, do we think about them as a place where we build power, build strong communities? Like, how many people work for a university? Any idea? Um, how many work at your school? I I know I know what we're talking about with the student power. I would say our our university, no, all students who are university employees do not think of their job as something that will build power. They're not thinking about you as the idea of suing power or walking. They think union act when they think of a union, they think of like the Tatos or like the um cows people are characters. Mm -hmm. Old people who pay must not go to like mm -hmm. up in the wheel I go and think the union just did to keep them from such having too much of a sucky job. But they, but, but that's not the but there is a minority opinion about Tired of union ass people, and tired of Bill Suit Power help all of you. I'm sorry for the wrong glass. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is our role as white ass, right? And you, you can go in there and say, it's not your dad's union, it's not your grandma's union. Like, if you need to say that, say that. But our role as white ass is to be politicizing these people to build power so we can have stronger, not just campuses, but communities. Because my university employed 7,000 people. If we had 7,000 good jobs, that would be a wealth builder, not just for our university, but our entire community, because those people would have gone and spent money. They would have raised the floor for everyone else. Instead of janitors, like the starting wage being a quarter over minimum wage, they could have said, well, WSU's paying $12 now. Why you have to match that? So that's how we need to be viewing our universities. It's a community wealth builder. These are jobs that can't be outsourced. So we need to make them good jobs. If we refuse to engage these people, like if we can't talk to students and RAs and say, what do you need to make your job better? What would make the student's life more enjoyable at our university? We're not gonna lift the floor for anyone. And this is the time in the students' lives where like, if you talk to them about unions now, you'll radically transform <coughs> how they view it later on. Hey, the reason why SB5, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, Florida, New Hampshire, Maine, the list goes on and on. It's happening because people don't understand what unions are. Because they do think it's the thing that prevents my job from being sucked. What we need to do is start changing how students engage with the union mentality and talk to them about what, does, what can you do? Because I'm a union member. Who else in this room is? And that's a problem. So when you go back to your universities, you need to be engaging other young people and talk about what does this look like? What would it mean if we were to take all their A's, 
and unionizing? What if we went into our dining halls and unionizing? And if you can't do that, like if people feel like that's too big to jump, what about a living wage? What about a right to health care? There are things we can do to build power in our campuses and transform our society. But it sounds like people are getting out. I want to make sure everyone has time to go to your next workshop. Are there any quick questions or like lingering thoughts you want to get out yeah. real quick? Um, well, I think this is a really good like brainstorming type of session and stuff. Um, one thing I would just add to what you were saying in, is uh, basically you're talking about solidarity and stuff, and um, I think that's one way to to build up this um, you know this mentality of, of uh, uh, fighting for better ways and working conditions and stuff is uh, trying to make an effort to reach out and connect students and workers in the in the towns where we live in and stuff um, to those who are already fighting. That can be an example that they can learn from. Um, you know, that, I think uh, solidarity is um, <clears throat> that you, you learn from others and then people change in the process. Yes. I think one of the most powerful quotes I've ever heard is the truth that one, the proof that one truly believes is in action. Uh, Barry Breston said it. Who, I don't know if people know Barry Breston. They, if you talk to people that have been in the movement long enough, you're going to get very mixed reviews. Where he did sell out socialism, he did sell out. He actually sold out DSA in particular, uh, but he was a. Very powerful person, very important. If you look at MLK Jr., without Barry Breston, MLK doesn't give the I Have a Dream speech. Played a huge role in all of our histories. And if you don't recognize the name, talk to me, I'll write it down, I'll suggest DVDs or books to read. But when students take action with these workers, or when these student workers take action, they're transformed. And we just have to remember that. Like, it's one thing to talk about it theoretically. It's another thing to feel a tangible change in your life and those around you. But are there anything else? Uh, could you move the or log in? Actually, I'll just read it here. If you have any questions, you can find me at studentlabor.org. My name's Chris. I'll be around all weekend. And Dan, do you want to write your? Yeah, stuff? sure. I'm not fancy enough to have an on school email. I didn't even write mine. But everyone should scatter and go to your next workshop.